Welcome everybody to the Icelandic Roots Public Webinar. We're really excited today to have Karen Gummo with us. Karen is a poet, dancer, and visual artist. She's performed as a storyteller for almost 40 years in schools and libraries, museums, churches, senior lodges, and in the fields and forests. She's traveled across Canada and as far as Iceland to share her favorite fiction and nonfiction stories about her family, historical sagas, myths, folklore, and legends. Today, she's going to talk, She's her presentation or her performance is on Odin's Quest in the Prose Edda. And before she begins, I just wanted to give everyone a little bit of background if you're unfamiliar with Odin and the uh, Eddas, so that you have some context for her performance. So popular media depicts Odin as a powerful and self-assured Norse god. However, the Eddas describe him as more complex and anxiety-ridden. Odin finds purpose in delaying his own death at Ragnarok, the fated end of the world when giants and monsters will kill the Norse gods in a final battle. To this end, Odin sends his Valkyries, mortal women with a God-granted ability to fly to select among the best dead warriors from battlefields on earth and convey them to Valhalla, Odin's great hall. At Valhalla, dead warriors fight one another all day and practice for Ragnarok. These dead fighters are called Einherjar, which means army of one, those who, or those who fight alone. Only those who die in battle have the privilege of entering Ragnarok. Those who die of other means go to hell, a shadowy underworld ruled by a goddess of the same name. Odin often travels among human beings in disguise, usually as an old man missing one eye. <clears throat> he gave up the eye as the price of a drink from the mythical well of wisdom, which gave him knowledge about the universe that was hidden from him. In the sagas of the Icelanders, Odin is typically depicted uh, and appears among humans in order to help a hero accomplish a great deed, but only to assure his death in battle at a young age so as to recruit him as part of his army, taken to Valhalla by the Valkyries. When it comes to warriors, at least, Odin is always acting in his own self-interest to forestall his own death. And his meddlings in their lives is not that of a benevolent God, but rather serves the purpose of affecting an outcome he wants at Ragnarok. Odin is a complicated figure, and this only scratches the surface, but it gives you some sense of what he's about. Thank you, Karen. You can go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Jason. A beautiful introduction. I I'm feel very lucky to be in part of this Icelandic Roots um, educational presentation. And here I am in Calgary, Alberta, not far from my, not far from where my mother grew up, a child of Icelanders who settled in Markerville area called Tindestot at first uh, in 1889. So I am the great granddaughter of Ulfager and Austrother of um, Johannes and Steinen. And uh, the, the passionate explorer of my Icelandic and Danish background. So I wanted to just show you um, the, the wall hanging behind me that I made for um, a performance at a children's festival in Calgary. Um, and where we told tales that were from Yggdrasil, inspired by Yggdrasil, the world tree. I'll just show you the the um, the falcon or hawk that dwells at the top um, in front of an eagle. There's an eagle, a falcon, then the, the tree that is nourishing the stags, and then Ratatosk, the squirrel, is uh, over here, running back and forth between the upper world and uh, uh, Niflheim, where dwells Nidhogg, the dragon. And so this story that I'll tell today takes place between Ausgard, the domain of the gods, the wise ones, 
uh, and it takes place in Jotunheim, the land of the mountains, um, and all, all of this symbolic piece is referred to. So I give thanks to my ancestors and thank you to you, my generous listeners, and I begin. Hail to the speaker. And you might say that in your own home in response. Hail to the speaker. Hail to the one who listens. May the ones who hear these words prosper because of them. Hail to the ones who listen. Now it happened that there were two groups of gods, the Aesir and the Vanir, and they had been battling against one another for a very long time. At last, they found a way, a pathway to a truce, and to put a seal on their friendship, each of the gods and the goddesses spat into a great jar. And from this spittle, they formed a man so steeped in the matters and the mysteries of the nine worlds that gods and men alike sought him out for advice. What was his name? It was Kvasir, brings to mind Kvasir Thu. What do you think? For he was a, a deep and loving thinker. He was so steeped in all the matters and the mysteries of the nine worlds that gods and men alike sought him out for advice. Questions of fact he would answer in the best way he could in a factual manner, but questions of opinion. What should I do? Where did I come from? Oh, how do I start or finish or... Woe is me. He would answer in a in a way that made gods, men, and dwarves and all other worldly and inner-worldly beings feel like they've been helped to answer their own questions. His secret was his mind of more than his mind of understanding, his way of of setting everything, his, his way of listening. He was a deep listener. And he set everything in a wider frame. He would listen to recitals of questions with a kind, grave, blank face. He never intruded or insisted. Rather, he suggested. Hmm. When news of his coming traveled before him, all in, in, into every small hamlet that he arrived at, all salting, scything, swordplay, and sewing was set aside. Even the children stopped their prattling to settle down before him and look at him in his ill-fitting clothes and his loving, open face to hear and discover how to be a listener and how to help others answer their deepest puzzling questions. Indeed, though Kvasir may not have intended it, he became a, a powerful character for he had a way with words and, and with listening. And so there were two dark dwarves, Fjallar and Galar, who never admired anything without desiring it for themselves. And they were so envious of this wise man that they invited him to dine with them in their cavern underground. And he entered into a marvelous place decorated with stalactites and stalagmites. And he noticed that the plates and all the, the food 
was made of beaten gold. Don't know how you ate that, but Kvasar made the best of it, and and he was gathered there with a whole group of dwarves from the underworld. At last, Fjallar and Galar lured him into a back chamber, and before much time had passed, they had pulled out the knives that were hidden in, in their sleeves and plunged them into his chest. And at last and at last, Kvasir, the wise one, the one with the listening ears whom the people in Ausgard favored and loved very deeply, fell lifeless upon the ground. And as his blood poured from his body, the dwarves saved it very carefully in two jars and a cauldron, Son and Bodin and Odrorir. And then in their way, they brewed that blood with honey to make a sublime mead so that whoever drank of it would become a poet or a wise man and would have a command of words so that wisdom would be loved and remembered. Now the dwarves kept their possession of this magical mead a secret, and yet there were visitors who came to see them, and, and now for some reason they were so full of themselves and feeling ever so powerful that when the giant Gilling and his wife visited from Jotunheim, they lost their lives in no time. Fjallar and Galar had tricked them into, into peril and they died. And now Sutung, their son, heard tell that there was someone in the world underneath who had, who had killed his parents and he came to seek revenge. And so Sutung traveled away from Jotunheim and found those dark dwarves conniving and planning some other power-filled action. And he took them out to deep water, ready to dump them on a scary that would, where the water would rise and they would drown, for they were not swimmers. And so... They found themselves in a position that they needed to bargain for their lives. And, and so they offered up the gift of this precious mead, the magical mead, the mead of poetry in exchange. And Sutan was willing to strike that bargain with them. And so carrying them back by the scruff of their necks to their chamber, he received in his two hands, the jar, son and bodin, and tucked under his arm, the cauldron, Odrorir. Back in Jotunheim, once again, Sutum hewed a great chamber at the heart of Mount Nitborg, that crushing rock mountain, and transformed his daughter, Gunlath, from a beauty whom the gods favored, her beauty rivaled Skadi or Gerda. She had those sky blue eyes and soft rosebud lips and long flowing hair. And he changed her into a hag with dreadlocks and long arms decked with claws that dragged along the floor of the deep, dark cavern where she was committed to serve her sentence and to guard over this mead sitting on a golden stool. Now, unlike the dwarves, Sutan boasted widely about his possession of the mead and word traveled back to the hall, the halls of Ausgoth, where dwelt the wise immortals the gods, and Odin, the Allfather, was deeply worried that the mead had fallen into the wrong hands, and he resolved to change himself into a, a man, a handsome man, 
who wore a dark cloak and a wide brimmed hat. Blind in one eye, he set off across the river that divided the upper world from Midgar, the middle world, and then traveled over a desert of grit where not one blade of grass dared to grow. He climbed up a curtain of mountains and descended down into a narrow green valley where nine thralls were scything succulent grass. He watched them make their graceful sweeps across the blades of green, but they looked weary. He knew they were in the employ of the giant Boigi, brother to Sutung, the one who possessed the magic mead. And he called out to them in greeting. Oh, they called back. Would that you had something to help us. Our sides are dull and we are not nearly finished the job our master has set us here to carry out. Ah, said Bulwark, for that is what he had named himself. And he reached into his cloak and pulling out a whetstone, he sharpened the scythe of the nearest thrall. And then when that one raised it up and pulled it across the green grass that grew there, it cut it as though the very wind had struck it from the place where it sprang up. And now each of the thralls moved in close, asking that their scythe be sharpened so well. And so Bulwark obliged and finished up the job with great flourish. Now, now there were some calling out, could I have that wet stone, that hone? It would change my life. No, I wish for it. No, what about me? They all called. And Bulver, the worker of evil, considered and said, I will offer up this hone to the one who can host me, offer me a feast in the manner to which I am accustomed. And all of them at the same time spoke at once and called out that they could do it. And wouldn't he want to give the hone to them? And with a sparkle in his one eye, Bulwark held the whetstone out and then threw it up high, high, high into the heavens. And it seemed to linger there, glinting with the rays of the sun as it was carried by its charioteer across the sky. And, and then it descended. And the thralls turned to the left and they turned to the right and came together to catch it. And in so doing, with their sharp sides, they slit each other's throats. And all nine thralls lay dead upon the field. And Bulwark, the worker of evil, retreated back in the direction from whence he had come. But as the charioteers of the sun finished their job and carried that great orb over to the western horizon and there made a flare of all the brightest, most marvelous colors of deep red and orange. He took his cue and descended down to the great hall of Boigi, the brother of Sutum, and knocked at the door Servants answered and ushered him in to the great hall, and he gave his greetings. But Boigi was sitting there with his head in his hands and could not speak. I wondered, said Bulver, if you would have room in your barn that I could take lodging there tonight. How can you ask me that question at this moment, answered the giant. I've lost all my workers. How can I find anyone else at this late date? I am, I am lost. Ah, said Bulwark, but you may notice, and he stood up to show his full height, 
that I am strong. I could do the work of nine men. <laughs> said Boygie, looking him up and down again. He doubted that this boaster could carry through with a promise like that. But he was rather out of uh, other ideas, and he said, uh, well, what would you ask for in exchange? Ah, said Bulwark, one sip of your brother's precious mead. Well, that is a matter I have no control over. It is something that my brother takes great pride in, and I have nothing to do with it. Well, these are my terms, called out Bulwark, and he turned to leave. Uh, just a minute, said Boyke. Um, I, I can approach him. Once you've held up your end of the bargain, I'll approach him and see what he says. That's the most I can promise. Very well, said Bulwark, and he set to work. And as the sun was carried by the charioteers day after day, he he did his work. Oh, long days they were, and little rest. And Yggdrasil, Yggdrasil, that great tree, dropped down its healing mana from above, and, and this strengthened the bulwark even more. And so he had kept up his promise at the end of that season and approached the giant in the great long hall. Well, he said, I have kept up my end. Now, what about that magical need, that need of poetry? Well, said Boyke, I doubt I can do anything about it, but I will approach my brother. And he did so. And Sutan came back to him, saying, who do you think this is in your company? I'll not give up a drop of it. Off you go. And so Boyke had to report that there was no, and there was nothing he could do but send this troublemaker away, this powerful troublemaker. Well, said Bulwark, if your brother will not give it up willingly, we shall have to trick him out of it. And out of his cloak, he pulled an auger. Let us go ourselves to that mountain and you, you, Boygi, will auger a hole to the heart of the mountain where dwells that, that old hag, Gunlaw. And so the two of them went and it was Boygi who pushed that auger up against that hard rock crushing mountain and now turned it. And with each turn, he grew a little more angry at the one who made him do this. And at last he pulled out the auger and said, ah, I'm finished. And now Bulwark, to test the hole, went up to it and blew with all his strength and rocks and grit flew back in his face. I declare you are not finished this job. And so now Boygie took it up again and with great fury he carried forth. And at last, when given the chance to blow into the hole, Bulwark found that the grit disappeared to some great chamber inside. Boygie was about to strike this troublemaker with the auger itself when Odin, the Alfather, Bulwark, the worker of evil, transformed himself into a snake and slithered, shrived down through that hole, arriving in the cavern deep within. Gunla sat on her stool of gold, rocked back and forth, and rude the day she lost her beauty. Oh, and seeing the serpent, the snake slither into the room, oh, she said, that you were deadly, and you would slay me. But suddenly that snake appeared in a corner, a handsome man with one eye, a broad-brimmed hat, and a long blue cloak. Gunlad, Gunlad, he called to her. You, you have come here to take the magic mead my father has set me here to guard. You shall not have it. 
Rather would I spill it out on the thirsty earth of this cavern. Gunla. He spoke to her with honeyed words. He came closer and took her hands in his. He kissed her on the mouth. As he did so, all the marks of ill favor fell from her. She looked at her hands and they were soft and supple. Her cheeks had that rosy hue and the lips were soft and supple and like rose buds and immediately they were cast in a great embrace. She threw her arms around him and for three days and three nights they were lost in love making. And at the end of it, drunk with passion, Vunlod was ready to ready for any command that this man gave her. And so she took him by the hand and led him down to the places where the jars and the cauldron were were hidden, and he took one draught of each, and now he held all the magic mead in his mouth. And perhaps he gave a small taste to Gunlad, we're hoping so. But he hurried down with quick steps to the exit to this great chamber and suddenly with incantations changed himself into an eagle. And with great flaps of his wings, he turned toward Ausgar. But Sutung keeping watch always to his mountain and his great store that he kept guard of, even if his daughter didn't, and transformed himself into an eagle. And now there were two great shadows over the middle world, and now over Midgar, and all the giants, and not the giants, the gods, had placed empty jars and cauldrons around the perimeter of the great farm, the great wise people's place. And the two eagles now only one wingspan apart. But it was not enough. For Odin, the elf father, bulwark, worker of evil, the eagle, the snake, spat out at the last moment all of this precious mead and most of it landed within the halls of Ausgard. A little was spilled outside. So little, the gods were not worried. And Sutung, in the form of an eagle, wheeled away, screeching in despair. He had lost, uh, he had lost through, through, uh, through cunning what he'd won through force. And now the gods in Ausgard smiled, for they possessed again this magic mead. And the little bit that was spilled outside the, the castle walls was the poet taster's portion, they called it. And Odin, the All Father, liked to offer it up to a man or two or a giant, a dwarf, a god, and even the people in the middle world. He would offer it up and give them the gift of poetry. So they would have a command of the words that wisdom would be loved and remembered. Potra utu imiri seti aposiastiri uti er aventiri. The cat is out in the swamp, puts up his tail, and this adventure has come to an end. So, I'm going to let Jason um, give some responses and then offer it up to you to see if you have drank of the mead of poetry. I wonder. Wow, Karen, that was a really fantastic uh, telling of that story. Thank you so much. So, um, as you mentioned, this is the story of how poetry came to mankind. 
um, and it came through Odin, right through the through the blood of Kvasir mixed with honey, and um, he apparently seduced this guardian of the of the mead, uh, and uh, and was able to get it. And of course, Odin um, is is in some ways a, a, one of the fathers of humanity because we know that his his uh, great grandchildren and great great grandchildren are mentioned as real people in uh, the Icelandic Roots database, and that ties back in with. Uh, so I, I guess what I'm asking is, is it implied that he brought this uh, to mankind? He he got this sort of uh, gift of poetry by drinking the mead, and then it was passed on through his descendants. Is that your interpretation? Sure. And to strangers, for a stranger is a gift. And uh, so... I see. So through learning and through through sharing and understanding that there just was no poetry before. And... Yeah. Perhaps not. Although perhaps Kvasir spoke poetically um, for often if you answer a question directly, um... um it can be threatening to the listener, or it can be, um, well, it can stop them from their path toward enlightenment. So if you speak in words um, poetic, you're more likely perhaps to help a person get in tune with his love for nature or his desire for peace or her hope I see. for, yeah. You know, that's re that's really interesting. Um, I just want to mention before we open it up that you know this is mentioned in, not only in the Eddas but also in the Avamal, uh, which is written by Odin, and it says in uh, stanza one hundred and seven, "I made good use of the disguise that I used. Few things are too difficult for the wise." Now, Odhreder, which is the meat of poetry, has come up onto the rim of Midgard, and then in Stanza 140, he says, I learned nine spells from the famous son of Bolthor, the father of Besla, and I want a drink of the precious mead poured from Odhreder. So in that stanza, Odhreder is more the vessel, but in other stanzas, it's the actual mead. But at any rate, um, he's uh, extremely happy to have uh, tricked people, tricked them into giving him the mead so that mankind could have it and be in the hands of mankind which i think is interesting beautiful well i know uh, my mom helen swainson who grew up on a farm here not far from markerville and red deer um west of red deer um uh would said that her well and her mother the things are now we she wasn't called alma she was called nanny struna swainson or struna Sigurd's uh, Ulfeig's daughter. Uh, the most common gift she gave to us was a book of poetry. And and my mom's good friend, Ray Smith, who was a minister, a United Church minister, went to, Ice, also Icelandic from Manitoba, went to Iceland. And the first thing his cousin asked him when he got off the plane was, are you a poet? And he was able to say, well, Sometimes I try to be, yeah. and I loved, my mother always loved that, uh, our mother, and, and I love great. that too. Yeah. Once you get the sense that um, because this was part of sort of the pre-Christian understanding of the world, it, poetry became uh commonplace or something for everybody it was really it was central to their thinking central to the to the religious thinking um and and as part as much part of the world as how did the how did the oceans come to be how did the mountains come to be how did poetry come to be i mean that's pretty fantastic that it was elevated to that level of concreteness <laughs> yeah 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 well here's a little my my um wonderful third cousin Oither Magnus daughter, who I met in Calgary because she taught Icelandic classes at the Scan Center, Scandinavian Center, and then 
and then helped me tell the saga of Gretchen the Strong at Markerville. Um, she would teach us through um, giving us poetry. And it was really the way that worked for me because I can yeah. hold on to rhythm and pattern, you know, more than remembering the grammar. And so, and I think, and when I was there just now in October, I met, I think the woman who wrote down this Imer Thulor, Imer, I, 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 Imser Thulor, various rhymes. And it's, um, it, it's a long, long list of opposites. And, you know, Svarto Kvit, Kvita, Svarto Pjarto, Dimt, Dimto Pjarto. And it lists this long, long list first of opposites. And then it gives you some pieces like this. Tunglith, Tunglith, Tak to mich, O bear the me up to skia. Huger and bear me haufali, I heimana mia. So that's moon, moon, take me up, take me up to the sky world. My mind takes me halfway there to a new world. And then there's Tunglith, Tunglith, Tak to mich, O bear the me up to skia. Thar sitter hun mother min, O kember ul. Nia. So there's so so the, the second one is the same thing. Moon moon, take me up, take me up to the sky world. There sits my own mother carding new wool. Love that. That's great. Okay, well, um, if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat and uh we'll be glad to answer them. Yeah, maybe you know something from Stefan Gay. Maybe there's some poetry you have composed that you've forgotten about. You're welcome maybe. to talk about your favorite poetry or to share some lines. Mm -hmm. Even something in song form is welcome for the song is poetry put to music. Uh, what about you, Jason? Uh, well, I don't know. You know, I don't know where to begin with that. I, I like a lot of different uh, uh, poetry, um, and, and I'm interested in Icelandic poetry. I'm I'm fascinated by the the famous Western Icelandic poets and their work. Um, Cowan. Uh, Gotmor Gotmerson, um, other people, Stefan G. Stephenson. Um, and then um there's other poets that I that I like, like uh Christian Frau Dupale. And um yeah, so I find it I find it interesting and uh and and interesting to read and uh, for some of the more simple poems, I try to translate them myself, the shorter poems, because it takes a lot of stamina to do the translation. Uh, and I, I find that uh, rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, let's see. We have a people. question. I would love to have Karen tell more saga stories for us. So I think that's yeah. something definitely for the future. We'll have to have you back and tell a, a saga story for us. It sounds like you've done Greta's saga. Yeah, and Oyvind of the West Fjords and and the Stangerhook story that uh, that um, Kathy Josephson was talking about. We've done that one. And if you and Eva, there's some really nice short ones that I welcome. Ivar's tale. That's great. Yeah, so we'll have to plan for that. Um, it's so colorful to have you tell these stories rather than us discuss them in a more modern way. I think it uh, hopefully will inspire people. Well, I, I told it last night because I'm part of a storytelling collective called Storytelling Alberta at Calgary. And then I'm part of Storytellers of Canada. Then I'm part of World Storytelling Day and events around that and um, when you tell it in person it's more gratifying 
because here I am staring at that green light and I was right. feeling I needed to see the faces of my listeners. Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, but I'm just imagining all of you. And, uh, and I was thinking, did anybody have, you know, I love, like, I've, I've only come up with that myself where I said, Kvasir, his name, it must, you know, must have to do with the words. Kval Seir Thu. Kval Seir Thu. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I'm just guessing. You know, what do you think? What, what do you say? Um, so they're just little things. I've told that story. I think I first told that story at the Galt Museum in Lethbridge, Alberta, at a storytelling festival. And it was very terrifying because, well, I don't think any of them knew um, very many Norse myths, but oh, it's, you know, a little bit terrifying to tell it to people who you think might know the story or even if they've read this, the same translation that I read and I should pay tribute to that if I want to. It's um, Kevin Crossley Holland who's uh, the book that my sister Faye uh, from um, Pender Island now um, but Faye is also a storyteller and she and I have done some things together Odin's Daughters uh, Lovers what was it? Uh, something about lovers and other demons we did uh, um, together and we've done other things and um, we'd be happy to do something together I bet <laughs> she thinks she might be listening right now and um uh but what was I getting at um oh boy yeah Kevin Crossley Holland she gave me that book for my birthday in a oh, really long time ago and at first I didn't know if I could even you know get into it because I struggled with the violence and, you know, but now I've been helped to see how it's, um, you know, maybe a mirror of the, the violence of nature. Nature's a dangerous thing. Um, it's a mirror of human struggles that continue to plague us. Um, and, uh, but then the, oh, the other person that I relied upon for my, for this version is Padraic Colum, and he was a storyteller from Ireland. And his telling is more is well, both are dramatic, but I loved his love scenes and and the sort of details of Glenla calling out to fiercely defend her what she's supposed to the mead to be loyal to her father. Anyway, that's great. Yeah, I mean, one thing uh, people should know if they don't know it already is that these the originally these poems were, um, were were what what are called kennings, and they would um, you know they were often written for kings in Norway by Icelanders, and to make the poems have the right have the proper rhythm and rhyme, uh, they would often have to uh, have sort of oblique references to the Eddas and to these old stories about Odin and, um, you know, the, the drinking of the mead or whatever, um, you know, the, 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 the rainbow bridge or whatever they were talking about. And um, so a lot of what's preserved about um, the, these, this ancient religion uh, is because of that practice that in order to make the poems rhyme so well, they had to Make these uh, so these kind of indirect references to um, the stories in the Eddas, and so that's how we yep. have that. Is is actually sort of I, I don't want to say ironically, but we we preserved this this story itself um, through poetry because it was required to use to make references to these things uh, with poetry. Yeah. And and they, their rules about poetic diction were quite fierce. And yeah. to comply to yeah. them, I think Stefan Gay still complied to them. Um, and another thing I discovered is that, that Odin was worshipped by the Teutonic people. So the Germanic people in Germany yeah. and Poland and many, wherever the Teutonic people dwelt, maybe even in the Netherlands and that's right. It's a very, it's extremely old uh, religion, and uh, um, we know very little about it. Most of what we know comes from Snorri Sturluson and his writings. So it gives and us. Yeah, 
And I'm fascinated to know that the eyes here might refer to Asian people. So there are Asian influences. Right. I've heard that before. Yeah. I love that because we're all related. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the, yeah, and the early stories talk about how people came to Scandinavia from the Asian steppe, from the plains uh, near the Caucasus. And so who knows how old that story is, but it could refer to, uh, you know, really early cultures and human cultures that predated um, even European settlements. So. All right. Well, if, if there are any more questions, now's the time to put them in. If not, we can... Uh... There'll, there'll, oh, there'll be a chance to um, respond on either January 29th, which is a Monday, or February 26th. I've been communicating with Judy Dixon about that. So you know, if you feel yeah, so inspired... Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So if you're if you're listening and um, if you're a member of Icelandic Roots um, of any capacity, um, you could be a Samkoma member um, or or a regular member, um, then you can join uh, the book club. And uh, it sounds like you'll be you'll be uh, or not the book club. I'm sorry, the, the Samtal Hour and you'll be. Uh, the presenter or the discussant at the Santal Hour uh, on those dates. Is that right? On one of those dates. One of those dates. Okay. Which one? It, more, to, more to come on that. Yeah. Okay. Well, Karen, thank you so much. Um, you've really brightened my day with this colorful story, and uh, I'll be thinking about it today. And thank you all for joining. Thank you very much for giving me the chance. Thank you for all your generous listening ears.